please welcome the Atlantic's publisher and chief revenue officer, Alex McCown. everyone. I'm Alice McCown. I'm publisher and chief revenue officer of The Atlantic. And we're so delighted for you to join us for this important conversation about climate change. The stakes couldn't be higher. Finding ways to mitigate and adapt to climate change is the opportunity and challenge of the moment. Today, we'll hear from policymakers, climate scientists, and innovators about ways to address today's most urgent climate changes, as well as solutions for a more resilient future. Before we begin, I want to thank our underwriter, Allstate, for their support of the Atlantic's journalism. Please silence your cell phones, but keep them handy. If you see something, hear something today that captures your attention, we encourage you to share it with your social network and use the hashtag TAF23. Now let's begin this afternoon's conversation. You can sit there. <laughs> and now for a conversation on powering our future, the transition to clean energy. Please welcome Carla Frisch, Acting Executive Director of the Office of Policy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Here to lead the conversation is Nancy Cordes, Chief White House Correspondent at CBS News. Wow, full house. I love it. Yeah. Um, hi, Carla. It's so great to be up here with you at the Atlantic Festival um, and especially discussing such an important topic, one I know uh, keeps a lot of us in this room up at night probably, but you're doing something really important about it. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about it. I want to start out by asking you about uh, the one-year anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act because you are really the point person at DOE when it comes to the implementation of the oddly named Infl <laughs> Inflation Reduction Act. Actually, if you had been in charge of naming it, what would you have called it? <laughs> oh, but Inflation Reduction Act does get to a very key point, which is many of the investments directly reduce the cost of energy and reduce the energy burden for Americans all across the U.S. Um, and reduce those prices. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a real bit of inflation there. But like you said, it also has investments in every sector of the energy economy. Um, and for us at the Department of Energy and many other agencies, we're basically living in our dream world with the Inflation Reduction Act. We had, that was one of three major pieces of energy legislation. We had the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which the largest investment in U.S. infrastructure in more than 100 years. That's roads, bridges, energy infrastructure, keeping our existing power plants online safely. Mm -hmm. The Chips and Science Act. So chips, the semiconductors, we've got them in our phones, our computers, every piece of energy technology, and making those here in the U.S. through the Chips and Science Act, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which uh, we are celebrating one year, and so much has happened in that one year. What can you do in one year? I mean, I know that it's, you know, it, it, it can be a slow process at first to get off the ground, decide what your criteria are for giving out grants and then actually building up the staffing to be able to go through what I'm sure are an avalanche of applications. So walk us through what you have been able to do in one year. Right. Well, for us at Department of Energy and similar with many other agencies, for 95% of the programs, and there's many new programs in the law, we have put the information up online and people have the information they need to come to us and to apply. And for many of those, we've given dollars out one example is for battery factories. Um, we've all been hearing about the importance of batteries for EVs and the clean energy revolution. Um, we've given out $3 billion uh, for building those batteries here in the U.S. with another $3 billion to come for a second round. And that leverages um, what's now almost 200 new manufacturing investments in the minerals or production of the batteries in the United States since President Biden took office. And you know, talk about how you've had to grow the staff in order to be able to do that and what the year ahead is going to look like. Absolutely. So we have grown at Department of Energy of significantly, I think, more than 700 people to be able to implement, to put this law to its best use mm -hmm. and move the funds as quickly and responsibly as possible. Um, one of the big growth and focus areas for us has been on communities and on jobs. So something we've done with this round of investments that we've never done before is require anyone coming to Department of Energy to get funding to submit a community benefit plan. 
So they're saying, okay, we've talked to our community, the community where we want to build this thing. We've made a plan. We've thought about the workforce, the diversity of the workforce. We've thought about the justice issues, and here's the plan. And then we actually, in deciding how to give out grants, we take into account how well did they do on that community benefit plan. Mm -hmm. And we've heard from many companies, is it's changing the conversation for Excuse them. Me, Executive Director Frick, the CP2 LNG export terminal would have 20 times I'm sorry, we're, we're conducting a conversation right now. You're welcome to ask questions afterwards, but we're having a conversation yes, right now. For the Will you publicly call on Biden to stop it? This is a climate emergency. We do not have time to wait. So I'd like to go on. Sorry for the interruption. Will you call on Biden um, to yeah. stop the CB2 LNG export so hold on for a second. It will have a climate impact 20 times that of the Willow Project. This is a climate emergency. Well, I do want to say we do, um, at Department of will Energy, on work on Biden LNG. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and DOE review all those applications, and we look really closely at what are the impacts of the application. Yes no we are. We are. She's, she's speaking to your issue. Could you please be respectful while she's speaking to the issue that you asked about? No, you don't. We are dealing with a climate emergency, and I think we're going to hear in the next panel. You're right, we're dealing with a climate emergency, and I think we're going to talk next about this past year, we have had a record in more than billion dollar disasters on climate, the, the fires in Maui, the flooding in Vermont, the flooding in New York, hurricanes, and that's what we're here talking about, how we're going to deal with it. And I think... I think we'd agree that there's. Um, I think we'd agree that this is an issue that you're very passionate about, and that's why you've devoted your career to dealing with these issues. And so, uh, when the when the interruptions subside, I'd like to ask you more about about what you've been doing to deal with the climate crisis. I think it's really unfortunate that you know this important conversation is being interrupted. So when you look at global emissions and the use of re U.S. resources, like we are still dealing across the globe with a lot of uncontrolled coal. And you know the emissions from burning natural gas is half that of burning uncontrolled coal. So in a transition, we've got to think about... But mm. yeah. so we are, at Department of Energy... We have an entire program, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, dedicated to how can we reduce that methane release. And where people have to flare, how can we do it much more efficiently? How can we move through pipelines more efficiently? Because we're in a transition, right? We can't do it all at once. We don't have, we don't have time to even consider building these new projects. Your solution, like carbon capture, that will capture less than 1% of the emissions from burning Right. So one thing we have done to support, we're hearing directly from black and brown well, communities that have been affected. Those yes. There's LNG terminals literally all over, and you are approving another one. So don't stand there, sit there, and literally tell us how you are listening to those communities. Because you are not listening to those communities. You don't give a damn about those communities. What we you do. You sit there, stand there, say, you're, say, oh, your career is minimized. If your career is about helping people, then you would not even consider giving venture global. So. The what?
So one thing we've done at Department of Energy, we have a brand new focus on energy justice. Our team has flown down and met with those communities directly and heard from them. And yes, black and brown communities have been hurt by fossil, have a higher burden of pollution. So what this administration has done is they've come up with something called Justice 40. And it says that 40% of the benefits, at least 40% of the benefits of federal funding has to go to those communities that have not seen the benefits in the past so to, to make sure that they're coming cancer. forward. I think, I think, I think you've had, I think you've had the opportunity to make your case and I'd really like to hear about it. To opposing the CP2 project, which would have 20 times the impact of Willow. We need a yes or no answer. And I'm not the person who can make that commitment for you, but every single decision going through the federal government right now related to climate goes through intense scrutiny and looks at what's the impact right now, what's the impact over time, and how. Please welcome back to the stage, The Atlantic's Alice McCown. Okay. Everyone, we are moving on to the next program of the afternoon. Um, we will start up right now. I'm introducing, sorry, not prepared for this, temperatures rising, addressing climate fuel disasters um, with Robin, Michael, and Sarah. So come on board. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, we say welcome to Mike and to Rit. We're so happy to have you guys here uh, to talk about this very important topic that we've all been dealing with, um, the less than ideal climate situation. Um, so, Mike, I'll start with you. Um, we've all just lived through the summer with these shocking weather extremes. Can you like connect the dots between for us between those events to climate change, sure. and like what are we what should we be expecting next? Or is next summer going to be even nastier? Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I couldn't help but notice that um, as this event begun, it started to get sort of dark and <laughs> ominous uh, out there. But uh, so uh, perhaps um, underscoring the reality that we all face now: extreme weather events that have been spiked by climate change are a reality, they're part of our life now. And some of the connections are actually really basic. Um, you know, I, I started out in physics, so I'd love to talk about thermodynamics. It's just simple, you make the planet warmer, you make the oceans warmer, there's gonna be more moisture in the atmosphere. Um, so when you do get rainfall, you're gonna get more of it, more flooding events. But the heating of the ground in the summer um, increases evaporation from the soil. So you get worse droughts in, in the summer in mid-latitude regions uh, like uh, the United States, Europe, large parts of Asia. Um, you make the planet hotter, you're going to get more heat, right? That, that, that one's an easy one, right? That's not rocket science. You're going to get more frequent and more extreme heat waves, and that's what we're seeing. And you combine the heat and the drought, you get wildfires. Again, it's not rocket science. Yeah, and we've been hearing a lot this summer about tipping points, particularly there was some new research related to ocean currents. Um, you also might have heard of this as the AMOC. Um, could that system actually undergo, undergo like an irreversible change this century? And what would be the consequence of that if it did? Yeah, the AMOC is not a congresswoman. Um, <laughs> it's actually, it stands for uh, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, but it's the, the ocean conveyor. Uh, if you saw the movie The Day After Tomorrow, it's the small grain of truth. Uh, most of what happens in that movie isn't going to happen in the real world, but that current system is slowing down. And it's a great example of how uncertainty isn't our friend, because the models predicted 
that maybe we would see that later this century as the ice begins to melt the Greenland ice that fresh water runs into the North Atlantic. Fresh water is lighter than uh, than saline water, and so it inhibits the sinking motion that drives that great ocean conveyor. We sometimes associate that with the Gulf Stream, but it's actually a current that continues on into the North Atlantic, keeps parts of Europe and North America warmer than they would otherwise be, and it's slowing down, and it's slowing down earlier than we expected because we're seeing more melt from Greenland earlier than we expected, and so there's an interrelationship between these tipping points. Once you start to lose that Greenland ice, you also you also potentially lose that conveyor belt. Now, nothing that's depicted in the film is going to happen to us um, except that uh, it would mean a, a huge decrease in marine productivity in the North Atlantic, one of the great natural fisheries of the world. So it would have a direct impact um, on fish populations. You know, 25% of the global population, wow. their primary protein source is fish. Yeah. And it would mean a, a foot of extra sea level rise along the East Coast for oceanographic reasons that I'm not going to go into. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you're speaking about uncertainty, and Rit, this is like exactly what you're dealing with like day after day after day in your role with New York City. Um, you know, I, I live in New York, and we are like facing this urgency to deal with the climate crisis. Um, let's talk about extreme heat. Uh, you have said your number one priority is saving lives. So, like, what do you? How do you start with that? Like, what are the choices or compromises you have to make when you're looking at an entire city of people facing these challenges? Oh, thank you. Um, to a certain extent, it's not uncertain, yeah. right? And to a certain extent, it's actually very easy to figure out what we need to do. The difficulty is how you do it. Right? Mm. Moving, moving the built environment of a complex, expensive place like New York is the real challenge. So when it comes to heat, there's no question. Far and away, heat is the climate disaster that kills far more people than flooding. You know, we know in New York City, <clears throat> excuse me, we lost 44 New Yorkers to Hurricane Sandy 11 years ago. We lost 13 New Yorkers to Hurricane Ida from stormwater flooding two years ago. But over the last decade, we think we've lost more than 350 New Yorkers to heat above and beyond historic heat levels during our summers, right? And the crazy thing about it, not the crazy thing, the, the tragic um, thing about it is we know exactly what kind of people those are. They're over 65. You don't die of heat stroke if you're young. Yeah. They have pre-existing conditions. You don't die of heat stroke if you don't have a pre-existing pre condition. They live alone. They're people of color. They're primarily female. And they are low income. Yeah. And what we see is people who, even some people who have air conditioners, who have conditioned themselves because they're so worried about the electric bill, that as they progressively get heat stroke and pass out, they still won't turn on their air conditioner. So one of our priorities in, in the Adams administration is actually to move towards a maximum indoor temperature. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, cities across the country, you have, uh, in your housing code, you say landlords have to keep the temperature no lower than X, usually in the 60s, during the winter. We're going to turn around and say you've got to have a maximum temperature during the summer. A little paradoxical, because we're also trying to get buildings to reduce their carbon emissions, and what we're basically doing is mandating air conditioning yeah. in low-income housing, because you know, rich people already have it one way or another. Um, but the good news, and, and one of the things that I often have to remind people is we can, we can address resilience at the same time as mitigation if we're smart. Yeah. And in New York City, we're pushing buildings to decarbonize. Many of those low-income buildings have these single-pipe heat systems that are really difficult to upgrade. The right answer is going to be window <laughs> heat pumps. And the yeah. great thing about that is you can electrify, you can improve your efficiency, and that heat pump that provides heat in the winter also provides air conditioning in the summer. How would the city support landlords in making that transition? <clears throat> Do you know yet? Well, we're working on that. And in fact, New York has the most ambitious building performance standard uh, law in the country. We call it Local on 97. Just uh, two weeks ago, the, we put out our rules for how we're going to implement that. It, it basically takes 50,000 buildings across New York City, gives them each a carbon limit that ratchets down every several years, 2024, 2030, on to 2050 when they have to be carbon zero. Um, and part of what we've identified is the fact that it's going to cost between 12 and $15 billion to do the upgrades that are required by 2030. 
12 to $15 billion in the next six years. I was going to say, that's really soon. <laughs> it's really soon. It's like tomorrow. I mean, you can barely get your kitchen remodeled in six years, and yeah. that's one of our challenges, is that this isn't just about putting mandates on people. It's about mobilizing activity. We've got to make sure the workforce is there. We've got to make sure the financing is available. And for some building owners, you know, the billionaires, the fancy office buildings in, in Midtown, they'll figure out how to pay for it. We have 1,300 low and moderate income condos and co-ops. People don't think about it. But in the South Bronx, we've got a lot of co-ops. In Flushing, Queens, we've got a lot of co-ops. Right. They're going to have to make a lot of upgrades, too. We've got to help them. Right. I feel like, do people know what how co-ops work in New York? You know, I, I, I may be too in on New York real estate. But like, right, it's just like lots of individual owners who are all yeah. in one building together. So it's like a collective action problem, essentially, That's right? right? That's yeah. Right. Well, we were also talking about sea level rise. And, you know, New York is essentially a coastal city. That's not like a, it's a different type of problem, right? What are the infrastructure challenges there? Well, coastal infrastructure, there's, there's no question. Uh, New York City is a, a city of more than 500 miles of coastline. Um, and uh, we've got lots of very expensive neighborhoods on the coastline. We've got lots of, lots of low-income neighborhoods. And so you know, we've done a lot of work over the last 11 years since Hurricane Sandy really turbocharged our efforts. We've got some seawalls going up on the Lower East Side. That project has gotten a lot of attention. But that's only the first of many. Right, positive and negative attention. Yeah, well, it, it's controversial. But you know, one of the issues there that we're all going to have to reckon with is that climate change is going to cost us. Right? And to some of those building owners, it's going to cost them money to do the retrofits. Unfortunately, the tragic reality is we're going to lose some views. We're going to lose some trees. We're going to lose some things we care about in our cities because we still have to protect ourselves. And we'll do everything we can to design those kinds of protections so that they provide that waterfront access so that they, they don't have as much negative impact as possible. But at, uh, on the east side coastal resilience, as you point out, when that is done, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to create a new park. It's going to create waterfront access. The, the barriers are basically going to be invisible. It did require cutting down 50 trees, and a lot of neighbors protested. And it's several years of really disruptive uh, construction going on. Yeah. So, like, there's no way to make this pain-free. No, yeah. Well, and to zoom out, like, big, big out for a second, um, you know, Mike, we're, we're about to go into COP28 this fall. That's, it's been seven years since the Paris Accord, and it also means we're seven years from this 2030 deadline for reducing global right. emissions. You know, are these global goals out of reach? Like, what, are, what do we need to do, and what compromises are we going to have to make here to avert this, like, truly catastrophic warming you were talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. And what, I just want to comment on the previous discussion, because we all often talk about the cost of taking action, and there is cost of, you know, new, you know, clean energy infrastructure. Although, you know, when we talk about fossil fuel infrastructure, it's often framed as an investment. And then when we're talking about clean energy, uh, it's suddenly a cost. Um, but the most important thing here is the cost of inaction, sure. far you know, outweighs any cost of taking action. And we, we've seen that in terms of hundreds of billions of dollars of damage by extreme weather events just over the past few summers here in the United States alone. Um, but what do we need to do to yeah. prevent it from getting worse? Um, so, you know, I try to caution people just today on, uh, you know, on social media, um, there, there was... Uh, all of this um, angst, you know, you sort of sense this collective angst from climate uh, advocates about the notion that we're about to cross 1.5 degrees Celsius, 3 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a critical threshold beyond which we expect to see some of the worst impacts of climate change. And we have to be careful here um, because when we look at that 1.5 degree threshold, and, and many of the policies we're talking about are designed to avoid crossing that, we're talking about the warming trend. Individual years sometimes fluctuate well above the trend because of, for example, a big El Nino. And we have a big El Nino that's emerging right now. So we are going to uh, either touch or maybe cross the 1.5C line uh, this year. It doesn't mean that we are beyond being, uh, the, the, you know, uh, beyond uh, our ability to limit warming below that critical uh, threshold. Yeah. Um, we can do that if we reduce carbon emissions. We, we all have heard the numbers. I think you were you know, alluding to them. 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030, down to zero, zero carbon emissions by 2050. The obstacles aren't physical. They're not climate physics. Uh, they're not 
technology. We have the technology to decarbonize our economy now. They're entirely political at this point. Sure. And I believe political obstacles can be overcome, particularly if people come out uh, and vote in this next election for climate forward candidates and, and vote out those who are rubber stamps uh, for polluters. And we can do it. We've, we've risen to the occasion before, we can do it again. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a related question. Like, do you think that 1.5C is still the right goal? And is that for a scientific reason or a political reason? So that's a great question. You know, originally it was sort of the EU that decided that that was, you know, a critical threshold uh, for avoiding. And there are objective reasons for it. You can look at the projected impacts of climate change. At 1.5C, they look quite a bit worse. 1.6C, they look even worse. 17 they look even worse. And so I do caution against looking at this as a climate cliff that we go off at one and a half C. If it is, you go off the cliff, you're done, what, what, you know, there's nothing you can do at that point. That's not the way it works. Every fraction of a degree matters. And if we miss the 1.5 degree Celsius exit, we don't go all the way to Trenton. <laughs> we get off oh. at the, the 1.6 degree uh, exit. <laughs> I, I feel like we, we have to have a separate conversation about Trenton, which I personally love Trenton. I just randomly chose Trenton there. I have nothing against Trenton. It really gets a Beautiful bad rap. city. Yeah, great tomato pie. Um, <laughs> well, so, right, I mean, I do think it's interesting to think about, like, the time scales that we have to do this work. And, I mean, it's interesting. Rit, you have been thinking about this for a long time. You helped create the first plan, NYC, our, our sustainability plan in New York City in 2007 in the Bloomberg administration. What did you envision then that worked and what didn't work in the end? What, what Now that you're, like, returning, what do you see different all these years later and what is exactly the same? Um, thanks. That's a good question. I think, you know, what's what's very different, of course, is at least in New York City, we certainly have the political wind at our back. Yeah. Right. I, I remember at the time having to explain to members of the city council what climate change was and get them to take it seriously. And they thought it was 100 years off. And now having experienced Sandy, having experienced Ida, they are pulling. They are asking for more action particularly on the side of resilience. Some of them are equally excited about mitigation, but yeah. everyone, like, resilience is bipartisan, yeah. right? Um, I think what's the same is, and, and Mike, I would problematize something you just said, because at least where I sit, we don't need that much more political support, right? New York's a deep blue city. We've got all the, you know, actually some great laws were passed, like Local on 97 already. Now we've got to implement them. Right. And what I think served us very well the first time around I was in city government is laying the foundation of institutions that would keep going. We established a New York panel on climate change back in 2007, modeled explicitly on the IPCC. It's still there. It's in law. Every three years, we get an official projection of how climate change is going to affect New York City. That has paid off because it's been working its way into our design standards, our building codes, things like that. We put in place the law that says we've got to report carbon emissions every year. We've got the best reporting system of any city. We have a legally required four-year sustainability plan that's kept mayor after mayor focused on this topic. What we're now focused on is the institutions that will deliver the change, right? Because the era of policymaking is over. My agency, the Department of Environmental Protection, which is the water system in New York, we are standing up a Bureau of Coastal Resilience. It, for, for in the period after Sandy, we kind of treated resilience as a project, right? We ran it only out of the mayor's office, and that's great for coordinating some things. Coastal resilience in New York City is going to be a project that is going on the rest of my life and probably the rest of the lives of everybody in this room. It's multi-decade. We, we need an agency for it. We also need to think about how we fund this over the long term, right? Last year, Mayor Adams actually called on the federal government to start thinking about resilience not as a reaction to an event, right, but actually as a forward annual formula funding uh, stream like we treat education, like we treat transportation. We don't ask, when are you going to be done with the Department of Education, right. right? We just know that's a thing. And I think resilience we've got to treat similarly. Yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead. It's just going to maybe a quick uh, follow-up um, because, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything you just said there. Uh, we are seeing a lot of progress in blue cities and blue states 
Um, you know, 30 percent of the American population lives in a state that is committed to climate action, but we need 100 yeah, percent of no the question. country to be in no those question. states. And, you know, one of the things that happened, uh, the mm -hmm. Inflation Reduction Act, the climate provisions were watered down because we had to get it passed a, a particular senator. Uh, there were 50 Democrats, all 50 needed to vote for it, and there's one coal state senator who, um, you know, originally there was carrot and stick. Carrot for renewable energy, stick for uh, the fossil fuel energy, uh, fossil fuel industry. The clean energy standard had provisions that required that, um, you know, that, that utilities provide a certain percentage of their electricity from renewables, and if they failed to do so, there would be a penalty. That was stripped out to pacify that 50th uh, Democratic senator. And uh, the numbers, when you crunch the numbers, the IRA doesn't get us to our commitment. It doesn't get us to that 50 percent reduction uh, by 2030. It gets us maybe 37, 38 percent. So there's real progress there, but we need to do more, and we're not going to do that without more support at the Congressional Look, level. I, I completely agree. I just I think it's really important for us to recognize the right politics are necessary, but not sufficient, because we've got to deliver, and implementation is hard. It is. I mean, part of what I hear you saying is you know, fairly or unfairly, I think of Michael Bloomberg as a mayor who had like an above and beyond political commitment to climate change. Whereas like, again, perhaps unfairly, but at least in my mind, like Mayor Adams isn't necessarily like a climate warrior like in the same way. And part of what I hear you saying is that like the system that New York City has now, it sort of lives outside the political will of any one mayor. And I think part of the question, Mike, is like, well, how could we get that on a federal level too? Like, how do we get to a place where there's like implementation will that goes beyond the political will of any one Congress or any one president? I mean, what do you what what would you be looking for that? Like, yeah. um, you know, like people do like few people do say that climate change is a top priority. Like, just thirty seven percent of Americans think that it should be the president's top priority, Congress's top priority this year. Like, what do you think would tip the scales in political will from people to yeah. make it kind of a constant? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. I mean, 37% isn't bad for, you know, number one concern because we have a lot of concerns out there right now. There are a lot of crises that are competing for our attention, our political attention. Um, but, you know, I think there has been a sea change with the devastating consequences of war. You know, in Philadelphia, where I live, uh, we had the worst air quality in the world for several days. New York City did as well because of that Canadian wildfire smoke. So we're seeing, feeling, we're smelling. <laughs> We're smelling the devastating consequences of climate change. And I think there is overwhelming public support. The problem is we don't have enough support in Congress. We don't have the sort of support there that reflects the widespread support there is among the uh, American public. If you poll the American public on, you know, do you support a move towards clean energy, you get numbers like 70 percent. I mean, that means there's a big chunk of Republicans who, who, who like the idea of moving towards clean energy. Um, you know, given all the other challenges we face right now, I don't think climate is going to get the prioritization that it yeah. should in this next election. Right. And I think the flip side to the support for general clean energy is when you pull people on more specific things, like a wind farm in my city or whatever, you know, like you get different numbers. I am curious, like you've both, both of you guys have been thinking about this stuff for a long time. When you think about like events that have like woken people up to this problem or, or made a, a sea change in people's awareness, like what is the one that you would pick that made the most impact in people's mindset? And, and you too, Rip. I'm, I'm curious what you both think. I mean, it's a great question. I think we probably both agree. Superstorm Sandy who was, you know, the, a defining event. Um, what, you know, I think is fascinating is we haven't had that Cuyahoga River moment. Yeah. Uh, back in the early 1970s, a river caught fire. That spurred the entire environmental movement. Richard Nixon actually established the EPA. There was public demand. When a river catches on fire, you've got a problem. And it just feels like we've had so many of those moments, but we live in such a divided world today. Um, we have political obstacles, uh, a lack of good faith in our political discourse. We have one of the two parties that essentially has as part of their platform to deny that climate change uh, is even a thing. Um, that makes it really difficult to, um, you know, to come across the aisle to, to find sort of bipartisan solutions. Um, in the absence of bipartisan solutions, if there, if there isn't one given the current sort of proclivities of the two parties, then maybe you have to turn out for one of those two parties, the one that really does support taking action on the defining challenge of our time.
Sarah, if I can say, I think obviously Hurricane Sandy was um, was a defining moment for New York City. But yeah. I think one of the challenges, uh, one of the things that is really necessary, building on Mike's point, is actually the drumbeat. And one of the things I've seen, Hurricane Sandy got our attention, but then it was a one-off. We didn't have another disaster for a while. Hurricane Ida reminded us we can have flooding from the sky as well as from the ocean. But what has really changed, I think, the politics in New York City is that in the last two years, we have seen our rainfall patterns change. We now have in New York something much more like a tropical rainfall. Yes. And it happens <laughs> over and yeah. over and over again. We had flooding this year on July 4th. We had flooding this year on April 30th. We had significant flooding on December 23rd, all of which, on, and three times last summer, in New York City, our sewers are generally designed to absorb about 1.75 inches of rain per hour. Um, that's our target. Not everywhere in the city is up to that standard, but that's what we build for. Hurricane Ida gave us 3.75 inches per hour, which, by the way, the record had been 1.75, so we'd always built to the record. Since Hurricane Ida, in two years, we've had half a dozen or more instances where the whole city hasn't gotten it, but specific neighborhoods have gotten short-term bursts of what would have been record-setting two inches or more per hour rainfall. That's not a pattern that New York City is accustomed to. That's a pattern that Miami might be accustomed to, maybe Singapore would be accustomed to, right? But we've seen the weather change, and that frequent flooding is actually what keeps it front and center on, on the politicians' minds, on the voters' minds, and it reminds people, we can't say, well, this is a one-off and maybe it'll, it won't happen again. Right. This is our new reality. Yeah, I mean, I, my friends joke about that, like, oh, we live in Florida now. But I do think that then part of the challenge is to keep people's urgency about it, to not just accept that this is the new normal. And right. so, I mean, one question for, for you in New York City is, like, what do we do next? Like, New York already is a leader in limiting carbon emissions. <laughs> like, what can we do as a, the city do as a consumer of energy? going forward now? Well, we've done a ton, yeah. and, and there's no question. I mean, New York City, uh, we've actually put our purchasing power, as, as you would imagine, between schools and police stations and things like that. We are a huge consumer of electricity. We've entered into a long-term PPA to f help finance a gigawatt power line that'll bring renewable power down the Hudson from, from Canada. That'll make New York City operations basically carbon neutral by 2030 when it's in operation. We've, uh, you know, one of the things, and I, I have to defend my boss, Mayor Adams, who's not only committed to getting stuff done, as he said, and, and he came in and, and really we inherited a lot of good policies that had been enacted but not implemented. Mm -hmm. Right? And I have had nothing but strong support from him in terms of implementing these things that make the climate commitments a reality. Uh, the other thing that we've done, and, and this is something that's a personal passion of Mayor Adams, is starting to think about food and consumption. So earlier this year, for the first time ever, we revised our carbon inventory to take into account not just the carbon we emit from boilers in the city and cars driving around the city and the power plants that serve the city, but also to take into account the emissions related to the food we eat, to the clothes we buy, the electronics we import. And it turns out that food is our number three source of emissions across New York City. And so it is now one of our things. We are, we've instituted a, a vegan one day a week in all of our schools. We serve a million students a day. Uh, in New York City, and one day a week they eat vegan. We've initiated, uh, we've started in the New York City hospital system, another large provider of meals, a plant uh, default. Mm. So your default setting on your menu is vegetarian. If you want meat, you can ask for it, right? There's no problem there. But that's gonna, that's a, a big step forward towards recognizing that on a planetary scale, We've not only got to think about, and, and we've got to not lay up, let up on the need to deal with buildings and transportation and solid waste, but we are going to have to change some of our individual habits as well. Yeah, I could say stuff about that all day. But um, this is going to be the last question for each of you. When you're looking ahead, five years, something like that, does anything make you hopeful? Mike, and then Rick. <laughs> Uh-oh. It, it, it's an easy one. It, yeah. it does. I mean, it's, it's the young folks. Uh, it's the youth climate movement, because uh, for too long, 
we allowed this problem to be framed entirely in, in terms that were advantageous to polluters. Oh, it's about economics. It's about uh, policy prescriptions. It's about science. But what it is about more than anything else is, is ethics and intergenerational ethics and our obligation uh, not to leave behind a degraded planet for our, our children and grandchildren. And so I think the youth climate movement has really recentered the conversation there where it always needed to be. And you hear, you know, how does that impact things? Well, um, many of you have probably he uh, heard about the Man Montana case. Um, uh, recently, uh, the Supreme Court of Montana found in favor of a group of youths who, um, who uh, were suing the state uh, for its continued investment in fossil fuel infrastructure that was hurting them. And each of them had a story. Um, each of them were able to tell their own climate story, a, a very compelling story about how climate change had impacted them personally. And the moral clarity and the moral authority of those uh, those um, stories uh, prevailed in a very red conservative state with a conservative judge. It turns out Montana has language in their state constitution that requires um, the state uh, to protect uh, water and air, and that was the premise uh, for bringing that lawsuit. Uh, the, 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 the children, uh, our, our, uh, our, our children's uh, future, um, our, I think uh, our children, uh, the name of the organization, um, uh, our children's trust uh, is the name of the organization. Uh, they, um, you know, uh, they, they prevailed in that case, and it now sets a precedent because there's similar language. It turns out in most state constitutions, and so when you're looking for successes, when you're look, looking for success stories at a time when it feels uh, overwhelming and it feels like we're not making enough uh, 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 enough progress. Look no further than, than that victory, the precedent it sets, and the role that young people and the voice of young people is playing in changing the whole conversation. Totally. How about you, Ed? Uh, well, I certainly agree that, that uh, younger people, the, uh, the younger generation that grew up realizing that climate change was an issue is, is a big deal. The other thing, though, is the sense that we are ramping up our ability to deploy, our ability to deliver, our ability to scale. Um, you see that whether it is in offshore wind or in renewable power or in heat pumps or all of those things that they're not all that sexy because it's, you know, financing and it's technology and it's manufacturing, but that is what delivers a carbon-free economy and that is what delivers resilience. Well, thank you both for all of your thoughts. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now for a conversation produced by our underwriter, Allstate, on resiliency and preparedness, strong building blocks for a climate resilient future. Please welcome Elliot Stoltz, Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Allstate. And here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's Alice McGowan. Thank you, Elliot, for joining me today. Uh, we're talking about how we are working towards building a more sustainable future. And before we really get into it, I'd love to talk a little bit and hear a little bit more about Allstate and your initiative that you're working towards for 2030 and talk a little bit about your net zero <coughs> ambition. Sure. So um, in some ways, I feel perfectly positioned to be here because as an insurance company, Allstate has been really dealing with this issue for 25 years. When you think about it, it's fundamental to our success that we manage climate risk. Uh, not only to live into our uh, promise to our customers to protect them from life's uncertainties, but also to live into our commitments to our stakeholders, our, our shareholders. So we've been working on this issue for, for a long time. Um, as you know, many companies have been uh, committing to net zero commitments over the last few years. We were 
I, I would say perhaps slightly, slightly late uh, on that topic uh, for two reasons. The first is we are a very deliberate, careful company. And when we make commitments, we intend to keep those commitments. We don't fail. So uh, we wanted to really understand our emissions footprint and understand how we were going to get to net zero. The second reason is more so than simply making the announcement and getting the press, we want to make an impact. And in order to do that, we need to understand what is our emissions footprint and, and how are we going to get there. So in 2022, we took a lot of time to dig into our emissions footprint. As you know, for scope one and two uh, emissions, that's fairly easy. Those are the emissions that are largely controllable by the company. Scope three emissions are much more challenging because a lot of those are out of our control. So what we did is, uh, uh, by the end of 2022, we felt comfortable that we could commit to a net zero uh, target for our operational emissions, uh, largely within our control. But for our financed emissions, which is our investment portfolio, Allstate has a portfolio of about $65 billion of investments where we need to know the underlying emissions uh, profile of each of those companies to calculate that emissions footprint. We needed more information about that, particularly from the private companies, which don't have as much uh, readily available data. So there we committed to have a net zero commitment by uh, the end of 2025. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. So uh, in 2023, what we've been doing is we've said, OK, we have this commitment. How are we going to get there? We need a path. We need interim goals. We want to make sure we're on track. So that's what we've been developing in 2023. That's incredible. So I assume you guys will evolve and iterate, too, as you work towards 2030. How do you see that happening? Or Absolutely. I mean, and, and the reality is that we may come up with this plan and we may make adjustments to this plan yeah. over time as the world changes, yep. as our business changes. Yeah. But, but our, our hope is that not only do we make our 2030 commitment, but that we uh, really have an impact. That's great. So, you know, we all talk a lot about stopping climate change. One thing that we've been talking about, which I think is, is really interesting and that you're really focused on, is building climate resiliency. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about what that means to Allstate and what climate resiliency means. And are companies able to focus both on mitigating climate change as well as building resiliency? So what, what I would say to that is, um, First, again, I would reiterate, all states in a great position, and other insurers are in a great position because they have been focused on this issue. They've had to focus on this issue with their customers for, for many years. We've been working, we have a disaster recovery kit for our customers. We've been working on resiliency for a long time. The answer to your question is, I think companies have to focus on this issue. Because while so much effort has gone into reducing the impact of climate change, we don't know how successful we will be there will be climate change to one degree or another, no pun intended. Um, and we, so resiliency is a very important part. So we need to help individuals and consumers and, and communities uh, be able to address climate change and the impact of climate change. So we have been very focused on that um, for a long time now. Yeah, I think that's incredible. Um, so if we look a little bit further ahead and, and, you know, there's a lot of conversations that are kind of depressing or kind of doom and gloom, but is there any kind of silver lining or anything out there that we can be positive about when, it talk, when we talk about climate? Uh, which is an interesting topic. So uh, I would be, the quick answer is yes. Um, and I, I, w I would uh, emphasize, we do not simply view climate change as a risk. We also view it as an opportunity. There are opportunities in our investment portfolio, for example, to participate in the transition. There will be companies that perhaps don't even exist today that will be major companies 
10 years from now, we want to be the ones investing in those companies. There are opportunities for our products. If there are ways that we can help through our products, customers to address climate change. So we don't simply view this as a conversation about risk, although that tends to be where it goes. We also view this as a source of opportunities. I will start this conversation. I will end on an optimistic yes. note, I promise. Good, good. Um, but I'm going to start with some very sobering statistics. Yes. Yeah, I, everyone needs to hear these statistics. A decade ago, we were uh, dealing with an average of about 10 <coughs> catastrophes a year. Excuse me, 100 catastrophes, 80 catastrophes a year. Uh, and catastrophes, catastrophes has a very specific meaning within the insurance industry. It's, it's not sort of uh, subject to someone's judgment. We were dealing with about 80. Today, we are dealing with about 100 catastrophes a year. So a significant increase, a 25% increase, just over the last decade. In 2022, we paid out $3.1 billion to our customers to help them recover from 124 catastrophes. 124, up from an average of 100. In, that was in 2022. In 2023, simply the first six months of 2023, we have paid out $4.4 billion, more than the entire year of 22 in 2023, just for the first half of the year. Yeah. So this is a crisis, Staggering. and we need to address this head on. I will end in, in a positive note because I think this is possible. I can foresee a day when this has happened, and it involves a number of things. Most importantly, I think it involves a comprehensive approach that involves both the private industry and the public sector. Neither can do it alone. It needs a comprehensive approach involving both, and that includes a few things. First of all, we need a healthy state regulatory system, and I'll give you two examples of that. Reinsurance is extremely important for insurers to be able to lay off risk. That goes into our ability to price a product attractively. We want to ensure accessibility and affordability of products. California, for example, does not allow insurers to price the cost of reinsurance into their product. Many states do, but California doesn't. We need to change that because that will enable us to attract, to, to price our uh, products attractively and really live into our commitment to our stakeholders and provide accessibility to, to our customers. Another example is that uh, historically, uh, insurance pricing has been retrospective. It's looked backwards. One of the challenges on many fronts with, with climate is that you can't really look backwards to figure out where climate change is going. You need to look forward. And so prospective models need to be uh, used in pricing insurance moving forward to really address this issue. Second, we need to increase the financial strengths of our states and the federal government. Right now, uh, the Florida Insurance Plan Citizens, which is viewed as the insurer of last resort, is one Category 4 hurricane away from failure. One Category 4 hurricane away from failure. New York State has no insurance plan. The federal government will be called upon to backstop when those plans fail or don't have sufficient funds. So we really need to get on a firm financial footing. Um, the federal government spends billions of dollars every year on, on climate change and on catastrophes. Uh, from 2005 to 2019, the federal government spent $460 billion on catastrophes. Right now, FEMA's Disaster Response Fund, $3.4 billion. That's it. Biden has recently increased his request from $12, million, $12 billion to $16 billion. Uh, 
to, to establish a, a stronger financial footing, but we've got to establish a much more strong financial footing. Um, we need to ensure preparedness at all levels, you know, at evacuation routes, uh, planning, uh, first, adequate first responder staffing. But I envision a day, I'm trying to be positive, <laughs> I, I envision a day when this will be the case, when people will understand. The reality is, as someone said, people are not only seeing, they are smelling the impacts of climate change yeah. with fires, they are living through them, they are losing their loved ones. I think that this will generate sufficient interest to propel our legislature, our executive branch, our private companies to all contribute to a very comprehensive solution. So I am optimistic that in so that it, that's the silver lining. That's right? the silver that's lining the that I see. I see it in ten years. Yeah. I see it in in time. Yeah. All so. right. Well, thank you so much, Elliot. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Here to discuss tackling climate change, innovative solutions, please welcome Gilbert Campbell, founder and CEO of Volt Energy Utility. Marissa Hughes, environmental resilience research lead at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And Toby Kears, executive director of the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. Here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's executive producer of audio, Claudine Abayad. Hi, hello. Um, welcome, Gilbert, Marissa, and Toby. Um, if ever there was a time for a need for innovators, this is our time, and these are our people. <laughs> so, um, Toby, I want to start with you. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I think when people think about a spokes plant for the environment, it's usually the tree, right? But I think you've been doing some remarkable and surprising work. Um, you have found that there are solutions to climate change growing just beneath the ground all around us. Uh, a recent study that you fielded found that fungi, fungi, perfect, <laughs> however you want to say it, pick one, right? Will pull down 36% of global fossil fuel emissions. That is a lot. <laughs> it's enough to cancel out the yearly carbon pollution from China, the world's largest carbon emitter. Um, can you tell us how these fungal networks work? So fungi are more than organisms. They are infrastructures. And if we think about forests and grasslands as the lungs of our planet, then these fungal networks are really the circulatory system. They are responsible for moving nutrients across ecosystems and, as you said, drawing down vast amounts of carbon. And they do this because they make a symbiosis with plant roots and they form these complex networks underground that scavenge for nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and feed it up to the plant. And in return, plants give them carbon. So it's a beautiful nexus, actually, studying these fungal networks between biodiversity, all the biodiversity that we cherish above ground, and carbon drawdown below ground. Um, I'm going to talk to you, Gilbert, about uh, something that doesn't have to do with plants. Um, <laughs> we know that, though, even as innovative solutions you know, come online to push us forward, marginalized communities can unjustly be left behind. Uh, you advocate for climate justice to be at the forefront of the transition to clean energy. Can you talk a little bit about some examples in your work that show how <coughs> communities that otherwise would be left behind are being able to move forward with everyone. Absolutely, and I think it's only fair for the communities that have been on the front line of all of the wrong aspects of like environmental injustice and that's minority and rural communities alike. Uh, so some of the things that we do, um, as an example, starting my first solar development company 14 years ago, we put solar on Florida Avenue Baptist Church, first African American church ever to have solar, great. But the, the reality of what we wanted to do was to show the art of the possible. So we helped the church establish a green ministry so people in the church could understand how to read the utility bill, which is intentionally made hard to read. Um, and so that helped them and encouraged other black churches to do the same. Fast forward 13 years later, um, being one of the few kind of African-American solar developers in the country, i uh, always wanted to make sure that more people look like me that have been dealing with these issues are benefiting. So I started a company that's building large solar farms, working with big companies, funding a foundation that's making a transform, transformational environmental justice investments in communities. So I'll just give one example. Um, 
we invest in students from historically black colleges and universities and through a fellowship program where we place them with internships, but then also like Fridays we bring in speakers from industry and when they finish, they get a $10,000 scholarship to be ambassadors on campus. So we just feel like Colgate had a, a, a slogan that uh, backpack marketing, this is a tabletop issue. And so when you can talk to young people who get it, that takes it, go talk to your aunt, your uncles, your brothers, people that may be coming home from prison to say this is an environmental health issue, a way for us to create generational wealth to make sure they're now part of the uh, climate equation. So we're just leveraging solar to uh, make sure that the communities have, been, have not been prioritized and are being prioritized. And, you know, what you're talking about there with having people, you know, invest their interest in getting more people to care about climate. It makes me think, Marissa, about what you were telling me um, regarding many of the scientists and mathematicians that you work with who climate is not their field, but they are doing work that now they can bring to climate um, work that they feel uh, very passionate about. So I'm really interested in, and you're working with AI, um, which is, we know, a very powerful tool to fight climate, the climate crisis. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the data that you gather and how it can be used to assess and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in some of my work um, in, in uh, looking at greenhouse gas emissions, what we do is we're part of the Climate Trace Coalition. So it's a set of different tech companies who are all working together to try to map out where all the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from worldwide. And we're using satellite data, um, local data, anything we can really get our hands on in order to do this global estimate that gets down to the asset level. So we're talking about individual power plants, pasture lands, even a single road out front here today. How much is that emitting over time and how does that change um, as we adapt our technologies and policies? And so I think that's the kind of data that we need to really enable more climate action and to move towards drawing down really efficiently and quickly. That data piece, Toby, is very connected to the kind of work that you're doing. Um, I imagine that you're using AI tools as well. Exactly. Um, but so can you tell us a little bit about how you are mapping fungal networks, how you're collecting data? Yeah. So we started this organization called SPUN, which stands for the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. And the goal was to map the biodiversity of these mycorrhizal networks and really understand who is where and what they're doing. And so we have to use machine learning to be able to predict where biodiversity hotspots are, for example. So we take data, we work with scientists all over the world who are collecting data on soil systems and then upload it into a database. And then using um, these, these AI systems, we can begin to predict not only where are the hotspots, but the particular functions of some of the mycorrhizal networks which ones are really good at sequestering carbon, which ones are really good at moving nutrients. And you can start to link these biodiversity patterns with the ecosystem outcomes that people really care about. And can you, you know, think um, a few years down the road, like what would you like to see happening with those mapping patterns that you learn about? I think one of the most important things is it allows us to monitor the health of the underground ecosystems and really understand who is where and how they're responding to climate change. Because at the same time that we're working at the global level, we have a lot of work going on at, at my laboratory that looks at actually the carbon flows inside the networks themselves. We can now visualize this carbon flows and how fungi control it. And so we can simulate all kinds of climate uh, changes in the laboratory and see how they respond. And so I think the biggest frontier now is taking that global data and putting it together with this very small micron scale data to see how underground ecosystems are actually going to respond and then how we can supercharge them. So for example, in restoration, there's about 2 billion hectares of lands that could be restored and fungi are not being considered in those restoration plans because we just don't have the data to understand which one should be used where. So these kinds of maps can help us then bring ecosystems back to the level that they once were. Um, Gilbert, I am wondering if you can tell us a little bit about some of the solar farm, um, a little bit more about the solar farm work that you're doing. It makes me, you know, when I hear Toby talking about the land and, and ensuring that we have, like, that we can restore our land, I'm curious about solar farm and the spaces that they take and, and how they can contribute to, um, you know, if, sorry, sorry, how they can, um, sometimes there's a, a worry about them do, how they can degrade the land, but they're also very essential to 
fighting climate change. Absolutely, and I think it's a messaging issue, but what we're trying to do is, it's pretty simple. Um, build solar farms in parts of America that have been left behind, where you know fossil fuel plants are being shut down, factories are no longer there. Um, and then, but if you look at those areas, you know, there are areas where if you look at, as an example, black and brown communities, um, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Detroit, L.A., I can go on and on, I can't find, you're not going to find 300, 400, 500 acres to develop utility scale solar projects. The reality is a lot of large companies that use a lot of power, like the tech companies, can, you know, the primary toolkit they're going to need for decarbonization of their power load is utility scale or solar farms. So what we're doing is developing solar farms in rural America, but also making sure the closest urban area that has environmental justice impacts and socioeconomic uh, disparities, making investments there through the vehicle that we started, which is the Sharing the Power Foundation. I'll just give one example of that. So uh, we work with companies like Microsoft. Um, they fund the foundation, we fund the foundation. And the foundation has made investments. I'll give two organizations. One is Gooder, founded by an African-American woman, Jasmine Crow in Atlanta. Uh, we help sponsor a mobile grocery store where she's taking clean groceries into under-resourced under parts of Atlanta to address food deserts. We also invested in the Center for Coalfield Justice in Pennsylvania, which is uh, training displaced coal miners uh, and to be part of the clean energy transition. So we're just trying to take... Uh, the solar farms put it for good use and make sure at the end of the day that people are suffering economically and also like have fought to make sure we've had power, risked their lives of black lung disease, or have dealt with environmental racism and make sure that they're really benefiting from what corporations need to do and make sure that they're playing their part but letting organ community-led organizations be the ones to make those decisions, which is critically important. Um, Gilbert, I want to stay with you for just one more moment. It's been a year since um, IRA was enacted, the Inflation Reduction Act, and I'm curious if you're seeing any benefits of that new legislation and the work that you're doing yet. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to talk selfishly from a business owner. Like, there's great things with the tax credits and stuff like that, but there's uh, within a now we're reflecting on a year, uh, three fourths of the projects from the IRA and the anniversary have gone in communities of color specifically in African-American communities. I believe there's over 130 projects uh, that will be coming online, which equates to about $53 billion in investments in African-American communities. That's one year. And then, you know, so we've got, you know, IRA supercharged, but we still have a messaging problem where, you know, we're dealing with a divisive country. But if we can just simplify the message that this benefits everybody, uh, hopefully we'll be able to really take advantage of um, the amount of capital that can do some really cool things and, um, you know, both, like I said, minority and rural neighborhoods that really need, need the systems. Um, Marissa, I want to talk with you a little bit more about AI and a game that you told me about. <laughs> um, so you uh, have created, it sounds like, a, a forecasting climate um, tipping points game. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think uh, something to, to keep in mind about AI is that it's really fantastic at, certain, at solving certain types of problems, but not all problems. We probably, if you've, if you've played around with chat GPT, you've probably figured this out for yourself. Um, but something AI excels at is playing games, right? Uh, it could beat anyone in this room at Go or Jeopardy or StarCraft. Um, as it turns out. So if you can give AI that kind of reward and point system, it can do really, really well and do really interesting things. And if you have a multiplayer game, then by playing with each other, the AI can get farther than they can with the training data that's available without that interaction. And so we're really concerned about climate tipping points, sea ice, coral reefs, um, the Atlantic overturning circulation. If these start, start to tip, right, if we start to lose them at rates that can't be replaced or they change state or stop or slow down, then we're going to have really accelerated climate change conditions. And so we want to understand when those things might happen so that we can uh, characterize them better, be prepared, try to intervene. Uh, so the problem is that there's such a large number of climate models and climate data sets that you can't really just explore them all on your own. Um, there's a ton of data out there, and that's, again, where AI can shine, is to be able to explore this vast space of different possible Earths. So we set up a climate game um, where one of the players is trying to push a climate model so that a tipping point will occur. And if it makes the tipping point happen, it gets points. The other player is trying to figure out, looking at a given input, whether or not the climate is going to tip. 
If he gets it right, he gets points. So then you send the AI off to play with each other, and at the end of the day, you get something that's really great at generating new scenarios for climate scientists to study so they can learn more about tipping points, and sort of an orderly warning system that we can use to see if those tipping points are coming. So I think these kinds of creative applications of AI can really unlock new spaces and new ways they can have impact in the climate area. How new is that application? I mean, like, have you had real-world use of it yet? Um, we've just really developed it in the last year. Uh, so, but we have been able to explore some climate models and characterize a few places where tipping points were occurring that we might not have expected. So our goal is to try to figure out what are the specific conditions that are making those happen. Um, Toby, you had mentioned about the fungal networks that, you know, that you're wanting to find the places that we'll need to restore. So, you know, it strikes me that humans are constantly breaking fungal networks, oh. I imagine. Oh. <laughs> um, and, but so can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what those impacts are um, and how we're degrading the fungal networks and what we can do to slow that? Yeah, this is always the hard thing to talk about. It's, it's emotional when you start seeing these, especially under the microscope, because they're like open pipe systems. And the flows inside them, the whole underground comes alive as soon as you see what's happening in these networks. It's, it's, it's incredible. And then we do things in the lab, like slice them with laser. We do all kinds of really mean things to see. And they're pretty resilient, right? Like they do, they do merge again and, and fuse and, uh, and, um, and start flowing again. Um, but at the ecosystem scale, it's, it's, really, it's really hard. So deforestation, obviously, is very bad. These mycorrhizal networks, they get fed from carbon from plants. And so anytime you lose a plant community, you're going to break up that mycorrhizal network. Um, and so obviously deforestation, urbanization, concrete, all of these things that we see already you know, hurting above ground ecosystems can be bad for below ground ecosystems. But the thing that I think people don't understand is the nitrogen problem. And that's the fact that there's so much nitrogen now in the air. And I'm, I'm coming from Europe, where it's a really big problem. When that nutrient saturates the soil, plants stop feeding carbon to fungal networks, because they can get it directly themselves from the roots. And so you have this balance that is, is being, uh, it's, it's almost a tipping point, if you will, uh, that's being uncoupled, where there's so much nitrogen now leaking into the soil that the plants stop feeding carbon. And that really makes the fungi disappear because the fungi need that carbon to survive. So I think nitrogen pollution is a big problem. And so agriculture is obviously very hard. Tillage is hard. Um, but they're resilient. They're resilient. And so I think now, now that we're starting to pay attention to their health, uh, that we can boost back their communities. Hmm. Um, we have just a few minutes. And I want to give you all the opportunity to project forward about what you would like to see in your work in the next few years. Um, Gilbert, can you tell me where you think you would like to see green energy five years from now? I'd like to see green energy looking more like America. Um, <laughs> I mentioned before reimagining um, what our clean energy side is going to look like. I mean, there's going to be trillions of dollars spent over the next five years. And we have the opportunity once for communities to keep beating a dead horse that have historically been marginalized and left out of economic booms, redlining all kind of host of other issues. We have the opportunity to get it right. Um, and so, but that also, you know, is looking at how can we make sure community-led organizations and financial institutions that know the community are providing those funds to the community? How do we make sure people in the community have to learn very fast that these are real issues and you can be part of it? So the optimist in me, and I think we will get there, but it takes smart people in this room to be able to talk to as many people as possible, even if they don't agree with us, and just say, look, this is technology that's going to put our country in the right direction, that's going to save average people money, and it's going to make sure that we reduce asthma rates, poor air quality like PM2.5 in communities that people are suffering, and it's going to put you know, our kids and our grandkids in a better spot down the road. So five years from now, I really hope that um, black and brown and rural communities are thriving, and that means that um, the IRA is the vehicle, but it takes the will of the people, and um, we're in Washington, D.C., and Capitol Hill to make common sense decisions to make sure all people are winning. Wow, right? Which I <laughs> said very well. Um, Marissa, uh, I would love to know where you think AI is going to go next to mm -hmm. combat climate change. 
Um, well, I think there's so many exciting applications being developed um, as IAI applies to climate change, from understanding our world, how it's changing, why it's changing, what we can expect next. What I'd really like to see is more of that AI making it into the field and making real decisions and really helping to advance us as a society. So I'd like to see those, those models and those forecasts getting operationalized. I want to have them on my phone to know where the air quality is going to be bad tomorrow. I want to be able to make decisions about resilience and hurricane preparedness using these methods. I think as they grow more and more powerful, we have to work to build those bridges and make connections um, to communities. Uh, to policymakers, to other technologists, to try to inform their decisions better, because it's a great tool for making decisions, but we have to get it in the hands of those decision makers. Toby, um, the fungi, fungi, our fungi friends um, <laughs> network, uh, now that we know that we need to take care of them, um, what are you hoping for five years down the road? And um, selfishly, I want to know, like, are there things that we ourselves can do to protect our fungi networks? I want a NASA for the underground, right? I mean, we just are concentrating so much above what's, what's happening in space, but really all the action and our survival depends on what's happening below our feet. And so that's where I see us in five years, is, is incorporating fungi into climate agendas, into conservation agendas, and really making the invisible visible to people. And in terms of the things that you can do, you can advocate for underground ecosystems, right? They are ecosystems just like above ground ecosystems. 59% of all species live underground, right? There's a huge biodiversity. It's one of the most complex ecosystems on Earth. We just have to start caring about it. Thank you all so much. Thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah. Thank you. And now, please welcome back Carla Fresh and Nancy Cordes. Thank you for sticking with us. I know you're busy. Uh, this is an issue that understandably sparks a lot of passion. Absolutely. And for those who are passionate out there, um, we do have at the Department of Energy website uh, cleanenergycore.gov, where we are accepting resumes from anybody who's interested to come and uh, work on this energy transition from inside Department of Energy. So uh, put the word out there to anyone who's feeling passionate about it. A um, lot of questions, not a lot of time. So uh, I want to ask you about the Inflation Reduction Act and you know the, the key component, which is all of these tax credits for uh, EVs and um, you know, all, all manner of, um, uh, of renewables. How will you be able to measure whether those are having the desired effect? Great question. So on the tax credits, Inflation Reduction Act includes 20 greatly expanded or new energy tax credits. Half of those are focused on businesses that are building, uh, for example, wind and solar facilities, and also the manufacturing. There's a tax credit, for example, 30% off you want to build a new clean energy manufacturing facility. Um, and then half of the tax credits are focused on individuals, on families, on consumers. Um, those are available now for 10 years. We've got 10 years of certainty. And for consumers, um, it's basically, it, there are so many opportunities. Insulation, doors, windows, solar panels, your EV, brand new, battery backup, uh, now can get a tax credit. And if you didn't know where to start, there's a tax credit for doing an energy audit of your home to figure out, okay, what are the other investments I can make? And those tax credits you know, are available for 10 years, so you could do a little bit one year, a little bit the next year. But on the business side, we are actually already seeing different decisions based on the tax credits. And if you look this year, can you guess the, the technology, the electricity technology that the most of is going to be built this year? Solar. Solar! Is, yeah. <laughs> this is historic. Um, this year, we'll be building 30 gigawatts, more than 30 gigawatts of solar in the U.S. That 10 years ago, that was a dream. 
And now it's actually one of the cheapest technologies, solar and wind. And storage, right? You can pair storage like a giant battery back up on the grid. We're building 10 gigawatts of, of batteries. And those investments, um, the companies are telling us directly, we're choosing to make those, uh, to build those facilities because of the tax credit. You know, when you talk to some of these striking auto workers, one of the big concerns that they have is that EV manufacturing, which is being encouraged by the, uh, by the government, is going to take place in China. How important is it to you to make sure that that manufacturing is happening in the U.S., and how do you make sure that that happens? Yeah, it's, it's really important. And in, embedded in the tax credits themselves, actually, for EVs, there is a focus on domestic content. So for consumer EVs, th those tax credits are only available for cars that are being built with domestic content. Um, then we have other investments, grants for facilities for battery manufacturing, um, and a massive build out um, in the US of battery and EV facilities. And across all of clean energy in the US, we've, since this president took office, we've seen 150 billion in announcements of new clean energy manufacturing, 150 billion of new manufacturing of clean energy in the US. And that's alongside um, 120 billion of investments from utilities in producing clean electricity, of course, used in the EVs. And what kind of advantage does that give the US down the road? Obviously, if, you know, if we're dominating the industry early, it helps. Yeah, it helps a lot. And we are um, looking at, in 2030, a $30 trillion global market opportunity for clean energy. And that's the question. Are we in the US going to be the ones capturing that global market opportunity? Are we going to be exporting technologies? Are we going to be working on that um, with, our, with the trading partners? So these foundational investments from the Inflation Reduction Act and from bipartisan infrastructure law put us in that position. And we're already seeing our trading partners across the world say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on in the US? Um, so we're seeing shifts not only in our domestic clean energy market, but in global markets because of these laws, because of the investments. And obviously, the cost of renewables has been coming down tremendously. But even DOE estimates that if you want to hit your uh, clean energy goals, that the electric grid is going to have twice, need to have twice the capacity by 2035 that it does right now. And, and our current grid just can't handle that. So what is the solution? Right. So we are making investments, in fact, $10 billion directly into electric grid upgrades mm -hmm. um, all across the country, um, state and local level through utilities. And that's about the resilience of the existing grid um, and also the cybersecurity, because that's really important, um, especially as we have more distributed technologies connecting. Um, so for the broader grid, yes, we absolutely have to expand. And there's a lot of activity right now in Congress um, on permitting. Because um, permitting is, you have to have permits to build the clean energy infrastructure. You've got to have permits uh, to build out the transmission. Um, so that's been a big focus area on Capitol Hill. And even in the, in the debt ceiling reduction um, uh, law, mm -hmm. the, in the debt ceiling uh, law, there was um, improvements in the permitting process to help with that. What about virtual power plants, which is, I think, you know, something that most people still don't know a lot about, but seems to be really key to making sure that we have enough electrical capacity? Right. So, well, let's start with what is it? A virtual power plant. So you think of um, traditional power plant, one big facility producing power. So a virtual power plant, right now, actually, with our communications technology, with the technology we use in operations in the grid, we can actually have the equivalent of a major power plant, but actually from distributed resources. So imagine you know, a small amount of solar over here, a bank of EVs using their batteries to put power back on the grid, um, buildings doing energy efficiency, so they actually would use less electricity than they were going to before or corporations uh, participating in what we call demand response, which certain times of day maybe use a little less, cool the building earlier in the day, and then it stays cooler. You don't have to use the cool during the peak. And you can actually add all of that up, and that adds up to the equivalent of a power plant. Um, that We are so sure about that. In fact, we have a loan programs office at DOE where we give out loans um, to innovative clean energy efforts, and we are now providing loans in the category of virtual power plants. You know, the secretary has spoken very favorably about nuclear 
power. The department supports um, bringing more nuclear power online. Obviously, the big hurdle is just you know the incredible challenge of building one, both the expense, the regulatory hurdles. What can DOE do? What is DOE doing to remove some of those hurdles? Is it even realistic that you know that we'll see an expansion of nuclear power anytime soon in this country? Well, just this year. Uh, we saw the very first nuclear power plant come online in the U.S. in decades. It's called Vogel. Um, and that it was under construction for a while. It is here now, and it is providing power. Part of it came online this year. Part of it's going to come online next year. So that is a very large facility. And what we're working on right now is something called small modular reactors. It's all there in the name. A lot smaller, modular. You can build them in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. um, we have been putting research and development funding into that for a long time. We've got companies with schematics. Um, and we think that's a big opportunity. And actually, the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law support some of the advanced nuclear demonstrations. So when do you see those? becoming a reality? I'm told in 2030, because I'm told there's deals being made right now. Mm -hmm. um, some utilities uh, that will remain nameless are signing contracts now with the designers of those small module reactors. What about carbon capture? Because mm -hmm. I know that's something DOE is investing in as well. How, how significant are your investments, and where do you see that going? Right. So carbon capture, capturing carbon at the smokestack. That can be on a natural gas power plant, on a coal power plant, on lots of industrial facilities. They actually, have, many industrial facilities have a pretty pure stream of CO2. Um, that's also a technology that we have invested in for a very long time. And it's in wide use here in Europe, across the world already. Um, there's a new tax credit. There's a tax credit for any technology you think there should be more of. There's a tax credit for it. Um, there is a tax credit for carbon capture right now. Um, which is also changing some investment decisions. Um, there's a facility in Texas, for example, that you know, didn't have the economics to come online with the tax credit. They're back up and doing the construction. So do you see that as, as a key part to the solution here? Right. How, and how, how encouraged are you by this technology? I am encouraged by it. And the thing is, um, it's very unsatisfying, but there's no one technology, right? right. It's just... It, it, it really lots is. Lots of different approaches, and mm -hmm. we'll find out what works best. Yeah, and we got to do them all, and we're actually stronger for it. We're more resilient as an energy system when we have lots of different technologies and lots of different systems working together, and carbon capture is part of that. What about geothermal? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So because ge DOE has yeah. talked a lot about how you know this, it's this untapped resource. I mean... Absolutely. Is it, does it have a large role to play? It does. So geothermal energy is using the um, natural heat differential in the ground to create power. You can do it at a very large scale, enough to produce power for the grid, or you can do it at home, actually. Um, and there's a tax credit for geothermal on your home. Um, if you have enough dirt, if you have a yard with enough dirt to dig down in, you can put in a geothermal system. Um, really, really efficient for heating and cooling buildings. Um, what we're working on now is something called advanced geothermal, um, which is advancing the technology and, and the way we do the, the subsurface work um, in different ways. And we think that is actually going to unlock the potential for lots more geothermal. And another interesting connection there is the workforce. Because um, imagine the skills of doing geothermal is very similar um, to some of the skills for oil and gas, right. of thinking about what's underground, you know, how do we do the geology, um, what are the, those dynamics. So we're seeing a lot of interest um, from folks who've worked in the traditional oil and gas sectors of, of checking out what's possible in geothermal and also in the carbon capture. How big of a challenge is workforce for you? I mean, obviously, like, suddenly you've got these hundreds of billions of dollars available. Do we have enough skilled workers in this country to fill the jobs that are being created? If we don't, you know, what does it matter that all the money is out there? And you know, how do we train those workers quickly? It's a good question, and it's one we're very focused on right now. So one thing we do at Department of Energy is every year we call every energy employer in the US and we say, how many people have you hired? How's it going? How hard is it to hire? Uh, Nine million energy workers in the private sector right now in the US. Um, IRA is projected to add another 1.5 million um, over the next 10 years. But the skills is the important part, as you mentioned. And we're 
um, talking a lot with our partners and unions. Um, UAW, as you mentioned, the building trades, IBEW electricians. Um, IBEW is actually larger than most university systems. And what they do is provide training up front uh, for an electrician who's going to install an EV charger, um, for someone who's going to install a heat pump in a home. Um, the unions are actually providing that training up front through apprentice programs. You get paid while you're in training, and then you're for sure getting a job at the end. So we are uh, really leaning on, on the unions to help with that workforce. Um, you know, we're looking at the strong possibility of a shutdown starting this weekend. If it happens, we don't know how long it's going to last. It sounds like your grant making is now in full swing. What kind of impact is it going to have on your work if we have a brief shutdown, if we have a longer term shutdown? Right. Well, there are very real world consequences to a shutdown. I mean, more broadly in government, you've got air traffic controllers. You've got men, women, people in uniform, not getting paychecks. You've got food inspectors, not inspecting food. You've got dollars for food for women and infants through the WIC program, slowing down. Um, definitely slow down our grant making and a lot of companies that are on edge waiting uh, for, for dollars from us. Um, and we also have the nuclear security mission at Department of Energy. Um, we, we maintain the nuclear weapons stockpile. And those people, you know, we want them at work. Um, you know, just a few days ago, the UN Secretary General sounded the alarm again, basically said, you know, we're unlocking the gates of hell mm -hmm. if the world doesn't do more about climate change. We've been talking about everything that DOE is doing, but can you talk to us a little bit more about how some of your global counterparts are doing in meeting some of these goals? How encouraged or disappointed are you by what other countries are doing? Yeah. So we do see good momentum, and I think... Um, a lot of that is spurred by this competition uh, for the big market share on clean energy. Um, you know, Europe has had goals for a long time. They're making progress. Um, China is investing a lot. China is the top investor in solar. Um, they're doing a lot of the producing. They're doing a lot of the building. Um, and we see investments um, really across the world. But we're looking at COP, the Conference of the Parties, coming up this fall. And that's the big focus, is maintaining that track of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. Mm -hmm. And then also really showing up to remind folks that the U.S. is a leader and we have results. We are now bringing results to the table in the international forum for a, that we haven't in the past. You know, we've been talking about this change but with Inflation Reduction Act, with bipartisan infrastructure law, we are in a way different situation than we were a few years ago, saying, here's what we're planning. Now we are doing it. Now we are seeing markets move. Now we are seeing new factories. We are seeing a, a whole sea change in the energy sector in the US. Right, because the economics just weren't viable for a long time, and now, uh, now they are. So with the time we have left, um, I want to ask you, first of all, as you look around your field, what are you most encouraged by? It can have to do with the Inflation Reduction Act because it could be something else that, that you know, gives you a lot of hope and also what keeps you up at night. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged by two things. I'm encouraged by the enthusiasm, by the focus. I mean, even the broad event here and all of you, thank you. Thank you for, for being interested in this issue. And the fact that we now have real world results. Um, and we're seeing, yeah, it's good for emissions, but we're seeing this renaissance in domestic manufacturing, this, this $150 billion in, in U.S. domestic manufacturing and clean energy. That's jobs, that's news factory, that's livelihood. Um, if you don't care about clean energy at all, you, you may care about that. And so um, that is, is very encouraging to me. And the only thing that keeps me up at night is can we deliver it fast enough? Can we? Yeah, we can. We can. <laughs> yeah, and that's why that cleanenergycore.gov site is very important uh, for all of your friends who want to come help us do that. Well, Carla Frisch, thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you for talking to us today and for sticking around. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. Please welcome back to the stage The Atlantic's Alice McCown. for your participation and grace as an audience this afternoon. While it was unfortunate um, that protest activities interrupted um, our conversation, but we also recognize that the things we talk about, the topics we have here, provoke strong debates, and that activists have a right to safely express their views. Our event, Code of Conduct, 
conduct prohibits all participants from disrupting programming in a way that depri deprives the audience of enjoying the festival. So thank you all to all of our speakers for being a part of such an urgent and relevant conversation. And thank you again to our underwriter, Allstate. Thank you all so much.